Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another edition of Johnny's Ambassadors Expert Webinar Series. For parents, I'm your host, Laura Stack, the founder and CEO of Johnny's Ambassadors, which is a nonprofit that educates parents and teens about the dangers of today's high THC marijuana products, particularly on adolescent brain development, mental illness, and suicide. We have another amazing guest with us today whom I will introduce in just a moment. As we go over a couple quick logistics, this session is being recorded. Please share it with your friends and family. Uh, Dr. Love has kindly provided a handout of her were of her slides that is in your control panel so that's available for you and it's also on the page where you are watching this recording and lastly we will be doing about 45 minutes with dr lev on her presentation after which she will take 15 minutes of your questions so as you think of them please enter them into the question box in your control panel. And at the end, I will interview her as I read your questions to her. So please keep those coming throughout her presentation. So with that, I will introduce Ronit Lev, MD. She was the first medical officer of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, ONDCP from 2018 to 2020. She brought refreshing frontline medical experience to national health policy. She is a nationally acclaimed medical expert and speaker who continues to treat patients in the emergency department. And she hosts a podcast titled High Truths on Drug and Addiction. As a mother of four, she relates to families who struggle. Lev uses data to drive change and is frequently quoted in print and television media. Dr. Love is a duly board certified in emergency and addiction medicine, bringing over 25 years of experience treating the frontline cases of addiction. And now we are privileged to have her here with us today. Dr. Love, thank you for being one of Johnny's ambassadors. Laura, it's an absolute honor to join you today here and to be a Johnny's ambassador. And I really thank you for um, the advocacy and education that's very needed and that you uh, provide. So we're gonna talk today um, about marijuana as medicine, because I know there's a lot of confusion about that and uh, kind of engage you in whether it's fact or fiction. So with that, we can um, get started. Um, I like to start with a quiz and, and it's a way to see for yourself how much you get out of this, uh, this little session. Um, so which of the following statements is true? Four statements are false, one statement is true. What do you guys think? Oh, um, we can first see. of all, medical marijuana, uh, medical marijuana is, a, um, is recommended to treat opiate use disorder, which is true, true or false. Uh, B, THC receptors work at the same area as pain receptors. So the receptors for marijuana and pain are in the same area. Or C, medical marijuana um, prescriptions are obtained from doctors who complete a standard of care evaluation. D, marijuana use increases opiate use with people in chronic pain. Or E, a medical marijuana prescriptions includes dosages and drug interaction considerations. So one of these is true, the rest are false. We'll figure it out at the end, you will be experts. And just a little caveat, I am a physician and I love actually giving uh, uh, unofficial medical advice, but we don't have a doctor-patient relationship. Um, I'm going to teach you medical facts, and I think that you should be advocates in your own health and health of your family and loved ones, but um, that just means you should be informed. It shouldn't be that you should be prescribing or treating yourself. That's, that's a slippery slope, so this is my disclaimer. Um, so let's start with our first fact or fiction question. Medical marijuana, fact or fiction? Medical marijuana is safer than recreational or other marijuana. Is medical marijuana actually safer than non-medical marijuana? So let's let's go through that. Um, first of all, let me ask you this. Name this plant. It's natural. It activates many neuroreceptors in the brain. 
It causes drug interactions with several medications. It actually helps anxiety and the schizophrenic effects that people have. And nobody ever dies from one puff. What is this plant? Well, this plant is tobacco. And doesn't that sound similar to the current plant that we're talking about? And it's important to learn from history. So what is marijuana? Well, a few definitions. Marijuana uh, is always confused with cannabis. This is not cannabis, this is marijuana. What's the difference? Marijuana products come from the cannabis sativa plant with a lot of THC in it. Um, mostly it's the female plant with the flowers and buds that have the THC, the psychoactive chemical in the marijuana product. So marijuana is all the products. Cannabis is all 540 products in the cannabis sativa plant. So it's really confusing what the two are. The medical literature uses both marijuana and cannabis. So I use those interchangeably as well. Um, industrial hemp is a, a political legal definition um, of uh, very little THC. The definition is 0.3% THC dry weight. In Europe, it's 0.2% dry weight. So very little THC and whatever dry weight means. Cannabinoids are a group of 60 different type of chemicals within the marijuana plant that we only really know a lot about two of them, THC and CBD, but there's many more cannabinoids in the plant that we haven't completely studied. What is synthetic marijuana? It's really, synthetic means it's made in a lab. It's not a plant. It's, it's a sprayed on chemical on a plant, that, so it looks like a plant, but it's not. Um, and it's not really marijuana. They take the main chemical in THC, change it around and call it uh, synthetic marijuana. It's known as spice and K2, and it is up to a hundred times more um, active on the cannabinoid receptors than regular THC. So what you need to know is that medical marijuana, and from now on, I will put that in quotes, and I hope you do too. Whenever you say medical, you put it in quotes because it's a political definition not a scientific definition. There is absolutely no difference in the plant, the medical plant and the recreational plant. They go it from the same uh, um, field, right? It's not one field for medical and one field. It's the same plant, same leaves. As a matter of fact, I visited uh, a cannabis dispensary and uh, they have different dispensaries. One is considered a medical dispensary and the other one, identical looking place, identical products is non non-medical. So it's really a, a legal definitions that they have to adhere to in order to consider themselves a legal dispensary. But it's the same plant, same products, same everything. Maybe they charge you less if you have a medical marijuana card, and, um, but there's really no difference. Also, um, recommending or prescribing uh, marijuana does not adhere to all the scrutiny that I have as a physician to recommend or prescribe anything to you. If I want to recommend ibuprofen or amoxicillin antibiotic for strep throat, I have to do physical exam and vital signs and a history and think about cost benefits and ask you, you know, whether this is okay, figure out drug interactions before I do that. That kind of scrutiny does not exist with um, medical cannabis. It's more reminds me of the pill mills for opioids where you go in, you have, say you have back pain or a headache and you get a prescription for opiates. No one says, no, you don't, or maybe this is a problem. And the same thing, you're gonna walk in um, to a medical marijuana dispensary. You're gonna walk out with a product and a card. Um, when California approved medical marijuana, they were thinking about compassionate, end of life care, people with AIDS. Um, but that's not what's happening in California. Less than 3% of everyone who has a medical marijuana card um, meets that criteria. Um, the average age is 32, and it's more a kind of get out of jail card rather than medical card, because I see that with my patients. If they have a, a medical, they tell me they use marijuana, I ask them, you know, they say, oh, it's medical. Then I say, well, what's your condition? And it would be, you know, a teenager with carpal tunnel syndrome from texting too much. It's, it's, and they know themselves that it's not really a medical condition. The problem is, as an emergency physician, I see marijuana poisoning every single day, every shift in the emergency department. And this is statistics from San Diego, 29 diagnoses a day that we actually capture. And we're really not even good at, at documenting that as a medical community. But this is what we are doing, even with poor effort, at least a diagnosis a day in the emergency departments in San Diego. 
What is marijuana poisoning? It's all these different things, and I'll go through some of them in more detail, from uh, psychosis to seizures to car accidents to anxiety to cardiac events to allergies to bleeding, um, so all sorts of things that we see related um, adverse reactions to marijuana. So now you know the answer. Medical marijuana um, is safer or not safer than non-medical marijuana, and you know that, that that's fiction. It's not, medical marijuana is not safer or anything different than non-medical. Um, as a matter of fact, they did a study out of the University of California in Davis. They went to um, dispensaries, 20 different medical legal dispensaries, and tested their product. And 20 out of 20 of the dispensaries, 100% of them, their marijuana had um, fungus or E. coli or was contaminated with something. So it's really not healthy. Also, another study in Truth and Labeling by JAMA, the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association, tested different products of CBD and THC and found very little accuracy in what was claimed to be on the label. By the way, as a tip, if you're buying any type of herbals or supplements and you want to know, like, is this is this really what it is? If you go buy something from a pharmacy, you could count on that being that medications. I mean, that goes through serious scrutiny in order to be sold at a pharmacy. Um, but when you go to, you know, Walgreens or Target and you buy vitamin um, D because you were indoors for, for COVID, you don't know if it's really vitamin D, how much vitamin D, what else is in there, unless you see one of these USP seals. If you see that seal, then that went through a very um, rigorous uh, standards process and you could count on it um, containing what it says it does. So look at that next time you go to the store. All right, another question, fact or fiction? Medical marijuana is recommended for pain. We hear that a lot. Well, I have pain, I need my medical marijuana. Is that true? Is medical marijuana recommended for pain? So let's find out. Okay, in order to find out, we need to understand pain. The traditional pain that we think of is that you stub your toe and that uh, injury to that tissue causes signals that go up to your brain. Your brain registers out, ouch, goes down to your toe again, and then you, you feel it. That's the traditional model of what pain is. But it's not, it's more complicated than that because there's different types of pain. This pathway that I just showed you is for damage to tissue, you know, broken bones, arthritis, cancer pain, surgery pain. But there's other types of pain. There's what's called neuropathic pain, pain for people who have um, uh, neuralgias from diabetes or um, have shingles and that kind of pain. So that's a different type of pain. And yet there's another type of pain called sensory, hypersensitivity pain. People have fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue. This is where the receptors, the pain receptors are no, not working properly uh, as traditionally expected and you're getting pain seemingly out of nowhere. So it's much more complicated than that. Also the opioid receptors um, are, there's different ones called the mu receptors, kappa delta receptors. Cannabinoid receptors are completely different. We're only now learning about them since the 1990s. They're in the brain and the, sp and the spinal cord. Um, they work um, again on, on, on the brain, also on the immune uh, system, but they're, they're not similar or in the same locations as the pain receptors. Let's go through a few studies on pain because I'm focusing on pain just because there's so much misinformation and, and saying, well, people say they need to use marijuana for pain. Let's look at the medical literature. First of all, textbook. The classic textbook on toxicology is called Gold Frank's Toxicology and Emergency Medicine. And Dr. Lapointe wrote the chapter, did a literature review of all a pain and saw that there is flawed science and very little medical evidence that THC helps in any type of pain and even very little in neuropathic pain. And they actually did studies in some of these, um, uh, I know this is a wordy slide, they studied it on 18 different women and very volunteers and on cancer patients and gave them pain such as thermal pain, you know, a burn or capsaicin pain that hurts, and then gave them marijuana products to see, does that help? And it really did not show a significant benefit in any uh, type of, you know, injury, nociceptive type pain. And yet there were also adverse events. If you look at the very last slide, last study here I have on the slide is a study by Whiting. 
Whiting study is like, you know, the godsend for the a cannabis community. This is the hallmark paper that says marijuana is good for pain. Well, let's look at that. They took 28 different studies, a total of 2,450 something patients. And from that, they concluded that marijuana is good for pain. What did it really show? It showed that pain was reduced from in 37% versus 31% for people who use marijuana. The marijuana, the THC that they were using was low dose. It was not anywhere near what is sold in dispensaries. You cannot buy uh, such low dose uh, marijuana now in dispensaries across America. It doesn't even exist. Um, and most of the patients where it helped had neuropathic pain, not the standard tissue injury kind of pain. And what they also don't tell you is there were some serious adverse reactions in the patients who got that as well. So it's important to balance that. Um, it, yeah, there was minor benefit in P, very minor, 31 to 37 percent. I call that very minor uh, benefit for people who had neuropathic pain, not the standard tissue type pain, um, with very low dose THC and, and um, adverse events that happened to those people. It, not only that, here's some bigger studies um, that show the adverse events of using it for pain. People who use cannabis actually had greater pain severity scores, greater pain interfering with their lives, less efficacy and be able to manage their own pain and more anxiety. And that was a study of 1,514 participants in a Lancet, which is a very reputable uh, medical publication and said that there's really no evidence of cannabis, marijuana, helping people uh, to stop using opioids. As a matter of fact, people who have chronic pain and use marijuana have increased use of their opioids. Um, and that is shown in several very large studies, up to 57,000 patients, uh, showing that medical, quote, medical marijuana users are more likely to use prescription drugs um, uh, medically and non-medically. So I, I think the jury's out there about also the harms. And you'll meet people who say, well, it really helps my pain. You know, that's one person, but look at the whole population. Um, of, of what, what it's, what's happening. And overall, it, um, and you don't know because they may not tell you um, about increased uh, opioid and prescription use. There's a lot of misleading science out there. Um, one example, the first one here is Butch Hoover from uh, JAMA said like, you know, if we look at all the states that legalize marijuana, their mortality from opioids is decreased. And they're showing this wonderful publication in science. And they, that doesn't make sense. I mean, you know, we're having more historic opioid overdoses in, in states that have um, legalized uh, marijuana. That just doesn't make sense. So luckily, there was another smart guy who came along, Shover. He did the same exact study that was done before, but included um, more years in the study, not just till 2010, expanded it, and he showed the opposite, exact opposite effect, that states that passed medical cannabis laws actually had an increase in overdose uh, deaths. Um, There's another study that showed by county level also that, you know, not only where you have more cannabis dispensaries, you have less deaths, the more dispensaries that you have, you would have less deaths. You know, if you publish that in the medical literature and it just doesn't make sense. Um, and you show these wonderful graphs and statistics. And luckily there are some even smarter people who showed, take that same exact study uh, uh, apply it to all states and show, again, exact opposite effects, that if you have more dispensaries, that makes more sense, you have more drug use and therefore more overdoses. All right, so that's very confusing and I realize that. So to simplify it, if somebody's quoting any type of study to you, just ask, how many people were in the study? Was it 200 um, or was it 50,000? What was the dose of THC? Was it 4% that we can't even buy in dispensaries now with a high potency? And who sponsored the study? Who's got something to gain by the study? And remember the lessons from the opioid epidemic, where we unleashed opioid on the entire population based on one study with 38 patients on it and said, oh, this is nobody gets addicted to opioids. It's healthy, everybody, nobody should be in pain. And we're only now cleaning up the disasters of that you know, false science. All right, 
And if all those studies are confusing, which I realize they are, we could just simply go to what medical authorities are saying. And here is a statement from the National Association for the Study and Pain that says there is lack of evidence in using cannabis products for pain. And we know the harms um, and the dangers with very little benefit, and that is not recommended by the Pain Society. All right. So we now know the answer to that question. Fiction, marijuana is not recommended for pain because of the lack of science um, in, in actually treating pain, lack of science as an opioid substitute or for opioid use disorder. Um, the studies have been very small. They don't use high potency pod products. Um, they don't reduce opioid use and, um, and uh, you know, consideration for all the, the risks um, and benefit uh, calculation does not um, that does not balance out. All right, another one. Medical marijuana can be used to treat opiate use disorder. Fact or fiction? Should we use it? People have an opioid addiction. They're addicted to, to heroin or prescription drugs. Maybe they should use uh, marijuana to help. And the science says no. Not only does the science says low, no, the American Society of Addiction Medicine says that it's not recommended to use cannabis for opiate use disorder. Uh, so absolutely not very clear um, black and white statement there. Glaucoma. You hear people say, oh, marijuana can be used to treat glaucoma. Yes, THC can reduce the pressure in your eye. Uh, but if you have a disease where you may go blind from, you don't want to be smoking a joint for that. You want to take eye drops that deliver a medicine at a reliable time with a reliable context. So actually, the answer is false. Do not, no one recommends marijuana to treat glaucoma, especially not the American Glaucoma Society or the American Academy of um, Ophthalmology. Bleeding, this may seem weird. Marijuana can cause bleeding. Who has heard of that? Um, unfortunately, I see that. How do I see that? Here's a flat light case. 68 year old man presents to the emergency department for internal bleeding. He is the third time he's in the hospital and he's now my patient. Each time I look at the record, he's getting blood transfusion, he's getting endoscopies. Um, you know, they give him blood and yet he comes back again with bleeding. But he is a chronic marijuana user and he's also on a blood thinner. And those two don't work together. It actually thins his blood way more than it's supposed to. And the reason he keeps coming back and there've been um, uh, uh, not a lot known, not a lot of physicians know about this, but if you look, there are people having spontaneous bleeding because their blood is too thin because of medical uh, drug interactions between their drug blood thinners and cannabis products, both CBD and THC. And if you want to learn more about this, go to drugs.com. Uh, that website has a drug interaction checker. You click on that checker and you could type in cannabis or you can type in cannabidiol CBD and you will see 300 plus different drug interactions with THC, over 500 drug interactions with CBD. And some of those are serious drug interactions like the ones I told you with the blood thinners. And I don't believe that most people know about that. And we actually have a, a project going in San Diego to inform the public about these serious uh, drug interactions. So yes, marijuana can cause spontaneous bleeding out of nowhere for people who are on blood thinners because of those um, uh, drug interactions, both THC and CBD. Let's do another one. Marijuana is recommended for nausea. Well, I need it to help my appetite. People tell me I need it to help my appetite. And yet they're in the emergency department scrometing. And so here's my case, scrometing. It means screaming and vomiting. And it's uh, um, another uh, word that we commonly use now for cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. I published a treatment guideline for physicians because um, patients come in with horrible pain. They are miserable. They're very uncomfortable. And at that point, nothing is helping them and they need and asking for begging for pain relief. And yet we were seeing uh, patients being placed on opioids and becoming addicted to opioids from an initial addiction to marijuana. Uh, we said, you know, time out. We have to find a better way to treat patients um, without creating another addiction. And we wrote a treatment guideline for the medical community uh, uh, and published that. Um, that's, we went to the public um, with that and that's uh, where the word scrometing came out from, from that publication. So the answer is false. Medical 
uh, marijuana or marijuana medical is not recommended for nausea. Um, there are medications now. I could write a prescription now for THC, um, uh, nabinone and dranabinol. Uh, for, it's usually recommended for AIDS wasting syndrome. And we've done such a great job treating AIDS now that I really hardly ever see patients like that, like I did at the beginning of my career. Um, so, but I can write a prescription if necessary for dronabinol, um, but uh, smoking it or eating it, um, especially chronically, can lead to scrometing um, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. It's not recommended. A plant with 500 different chemicals, a lot of them that we don't know, with potential um, carcinogens cannot be recommended as medicine for anything. Some of the chemicals in there, in the marijuana plant, may be beneficial here and there, um, but the plant as a total and, and smoking something, that can't be um, medically beneficial when you talk about risk benefit ratios. Um, and uh, we've had pregnant women say they need to help their nausea with morning sickness and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology definitely put an end to that false uh, uh, medical claim and it discourages anybody using marijuana who's thinking about getting pregnant is pregnant or just after uh, if they're if they're nursing. What about uh, neonatal health? Can marijuana cause stillborns? That seems pretty harsh, can it? Um, yes, it can. Fact, neonatal health, marijuana can cause stillborn um, as far as 2.3 increased risk of stillborns from using marijuana. It's marijuana cannabis has, is also a teratogen, which is another word of cancer causing agent. So it's uh, or, or causing um, uh, genetic abnormalities in the fetus. So really not not recommended to be using uh, marijuana if you're thinking about becoming pregnant or you're pregnant. What about seizures? Here, there's a lot of misinformation that marijuana helps seizures. And I see patients who have seizure disorders and they say, oh, well, I need to use marijuana for my seizures. And yet, yet they're in the emergency department seizing. That all came from, this, this is a picture of Charlotte Fiji. She had Dravet syndrome having you know, hundreds of seizures a day. And kudos to her parents who were desperate for a solution and found a, a solution in CBD, CBD oil. Charlotte was not smoking weed. Um, she was getting pure CBD, and that is now available by prescription. This is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing patients who are coming in the emergency department with seizures. They have a known seizure disorder. They're forgetting to take their seizure medicines, and they're thinking marijuana helps them, and it just makes them have more seizures, the exact opposite uh, effect. What does help with seizures? First of all, it's not general seizures. Seizures are a very common medical condition. The type of seizures that CBD, pure CBD helps is not common, it's very rare. It's in pediatric rare types of seizures called with people, patients with Dravet syndrome or Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, very rare um, babies who have this abnormality. It is not meant for the most people, the majority for 90 plus percent of people who have seizures should not be using marijuana plus they're getting all sorts of different chemicals. CBD, pure CBD oil is available by prescription. I can write a prescription for CBD um, and it's called Epidiolex. If you want to know whether CBD is healthy for your arthritis or you know your hair or what, their nail salon, they're selling it everywhere and you wanna know, is this healthy? Can I use this? Well, just read the package insert of CBD. And it's all these studies before the FDA allows approval for any type of drug, they go through uh, a you know, onerous procedure to approve that. And they have to do studies on any drug that's available by prescription and they have warnings. So if you open up the package insert of Epidiolex Pure CBD, you will see the warnings and the warnings are about liver damage, suicide, somnolence, sleep disorders, infections. So there are some, some risks. So uh, factor fiction, Marijuana, it's false. Marijuana does not help seizures. The plant with 500 different chemicals is not recommended for any type of seizures. CBD, Epidiolex, is recommended for a very rare seizure disorder, Dravet syndrome or Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, and really be cautious by buying CBDs from dispensaries. Uh, I was asked if I ever see uh, CBD poisonings in the emergency department. I really don't. I may have seen a couple of times, I think, in women who are using it for anxiety, but generally no. But I've seen plenty of people who thought they were using CBD and tested positive for THC. So factor fiction, um, heart health. Is marijuana associated with heart attack and stroke? That's harsh. 
can marijuana cause heart attack and stroke? And uh, yes, it can have cardiac effects. I should change the slide because just the other day I saw a lady who was had cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. She was hor feeling terrible. She had chest pain. And uh, I thought it was just from retching so much that she had chest pain, but I checked out her cardiac enzymes and she had a heart attack. So she had cannabis hyperemesis syndrome and a heart attack at the same time. This picture is a lady that I, I treated. This is not actually her picture. It was actually her head looked actually worse, but uh, she was using gummy bears for years. For two years, she's been using marijuana gummy bears to help her um, chronic headache. Um, and she used one and she passed out and split open her head. Now it's a type of cardiac event. It's uh, she, her blood pressure dropped and, and just as we took it. But she said, but I've been using this for two years and it never had anything happen to me. Well, there's no control. She may have been using, you know, sugar for two years. And that one time she opened up the gummy bear and it had all that THC content in that one gummy bear and the rest of the gummy bears in the bag may have had nothing in them. There, you know, it's not mixed properly. This doesn't go through a, you know, pharmacy type of scrutiny when they're selling these products. And just from one gummy bear. What does the American Heart Association say? And kudos to the American Heart Association for really writing a wonderful white paper that evaluates all the different potential pros of THC and the potential harms. And they looked specifically at heart problems, um, heart attacks and strokes, and saw a, you know, an alarming um, concern for associations of marijuana use and heart attacks and high blood pressure and associations with strokes. Um, and they made a conclusion that cannabis use shows substantial risk and very little benefit. And of course, everybody says we need more research. Of course, we need more research, but we have enough research today to, to talk about the harms. And, you know, we could always use more research on anything. Um, but we have enough information now that if you have a heart disease, you should not be using cannabis products if you want to really consider the risk and benefits. So, Marijuana is associated with heart attacks and strokes. As far as fact or fiction, that is fact. What about this one? This is easy. Smoking marijuana is bad for your lungs. Yeah, I mean, smoking anything is bad for your lungs. It could be vaping flavors and that's gonna be bad for your lungs. So uh, that's a no brainer. Um, but here's one of my cases, middle of the pandemic. You know, we are still, I'm wearing, uh, you know, an astronaut suit for COVID and have a patient come in with chest pain and shortness of breath. So he's put in the COVID ward and um, you know, we get an X-ray and he popped his lung because he's sitting in his room nervous, smoking, he told me, he's smoking all day um, uh, and clearly addicted to it. And he understands that and we talked about that and, and what it would take to stop. But holding his breath from using all that marijuana caused barotrauma. And this is not even rare. There's, I've seen this several times in my career. Um, um, but yeah, marijuana can, and because of that, you know, intensity of holding your breath can cause uh, a popped lung. The American Lung Association is very clear and cautions the public against smoking marijuana and tobacco products equally. Um, as a matter of fact, the CDC also cautions about, uh, if we remember, um, right before the COVID epidemic, we had an epidemic of vaping called e Valley. And uh, almost 70 people died from that. And uh, CDC stopped uh, measuring that and following that, tracking it given COVID. Um, but this probably still continues. Vaping has been a tragedy and just a big public health mistake um, because for every one adult who maybe, maybe, we don't know if it happens here, but in Europe that stops smoking, we've created 80 new adolescents who will be now smokers who never would have in the first place if we never had um, these uh, vaping pens and allowed them. So what do we know about lung health, marijuana, um, smoking marijuana or anything is bad for your lungs. And actually um, smoke from marijuana has the same toxins and irritants as tobacco. So if you think tobacco is bad, marijuana is not healthier or cleaner. Those are both plants. And people who smoke marijuana hold their breath deeper and get more exposure of tar per breath than smoking. And they did a very interesting study where they compared a marijuana joint versus vape um, versus a Marlboro cigarette. And the, mar the joint actually had three and a half times more secondhand smoke um, than a Marlboro cigarette. Um, also with all that, it's not surprising that there's a, a twofold increase in lung cancer in, in smokers of marijuana. 
What about cancer? Can marijuana cause cancer? That may be surprising, but there's clear science on that. Marijuana can cause cancer, and the American Cancer Association, um, you know, really uh, urges people not to rely on marijuana alone without seeking delay with delay of medical care. We've seen that people have, you know, uh, some rash and they think that, oh, I'm just going to use um, some TH, uh, some CBD cream on it, and years go by and it's been a melanoma. Or, you know, we really, if you have a condition, you should really get medical advice and not again, try to be your own doctor with marijuana or CBD or anything else. There is a two-fold increase in testicular germ cell cancer. This is uh, done by several studies now in clear association of testicular cancer and uh, marijuana use. And in New Zealand, they, they clearly, their lung association, I don't know why our lung association won't say it, but in New Zealand, they clearly say that marijuana use is associated with lung cancer. What about schizophrenia? Marijuana can cause schizophrenia, fact or fiction. We hear a lot about that. Can that be true? Um, this is what I see as far as mental health problems. People coming to the emergency department, um, uh, calling 911, believe this guy thought he was going to die uh, uh, after uh, smoking marijuana with his friend. He was uh, not used to it. His friend was using it, using it. She didn't have symptoms and he really believed he was dying. Um, and I could tell him he's not going to die um, and try to reassure him, but he still has that horrible, horrible uh, anxiety. And there's no anecdote to that. Once people take drugs, there's an anecdote for opiates. You can give naloxone and reverse that. For most drugs, including cannabis products, there's no reversal. You can treat the symptoms, but you can't take it out of the body. It has to go through its regular metabolic uh, pathway. Um, also, on a regular basis, we see excited delirium. This is a visual diagnosis. It's a very violent uh, diagnosis. People kicking, screaming. It takes a lot of people to hold them down, and we give them more drugs to get control of the situation because it's dangerous for the patient and dangerous for the staff. And after all that commotion, we try to figure out, okay, what drug was it? What was it? A lot of times it's methamphetamines, or you think bath salts, but sometimes it's just THC, just one gummy bear. This uh, gentleman was just one gummy bear caused this terrible violent reaction. Marijuana can cause psychosis and schizophrenia, and that's proven by what's called the Bradford Hill criteria. Um, there are seven um, Bradford Hill criteria in order to prove something is caused versus an association. They did this with tobacco, because years ago people say, okay, well, those black lungs are black, but that doesn't cause it. Tobacco didn't have it. Maybe they, their lungs are black because of pollution in the air or something else. It, there's an association, but not a causation. And by using Bradford Hill, we were able to prove that tobacco causes lung cancer and cardiac disease, not just an association. And we have that data now and all those publications now to show the association and, and, and causation of marijuana causing uh, schizophrenia. And if you continue doing that, causing um, um, that psychosis can cause permanent schizophrenia with continued use in people who otherwise have no genetic predisposition um, to, um, to schizophrenia. So uh, we've seen that five-fold risk of chronic psychotic disorder or schizophrenia from heavy marijuana use, seven-fold increased risk of suicide in Caucasians who begin using marijuana as teens, and recovery after a psychotic break from marijuana is a lot harder than um, recovery from a psychotic break from other drugs. What about depression? Can marijuana lead to suicide and depression? Um, and I know as parents, you have living examples of that. What does the science say? The science says, yes, marijuana can lead to depression and suicide. And here are the studies, big studies. Adolescents who use cannabis have a significant increase of depression and suicide in a study of 23,000 individuals. Um, uh, THC is the number one drug found in completed teen suicides in Colorado. And in another study, these are large studies, self-harm increased 46% in young men with states that, that have commercialized cannabis use. So um, the science follows the, the parents' experience. You hear this often. 
no one dies from marijuana. Is that true? Well, remember, we heard that with tobacco also. No one dies from one puff of smoke. No one dies from marijuana. Um, again, say that to the parents who, who, who's lost loved ones, to, to Johnny's ambassadors. Um, that's just not true, and we know that. Um, here's what I see in the emergency department. Um, this uh, man was smoking wax, high concentration, THC, 90%. And after doing that, he collapsed. His blood pressure dropped, and he almost stopped breathing. We had to put him on life support, um, put him on um, medications that, that raise his blood pressure, and we saved his life, but he otherwise would have died. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this happens. Car accidents, that's from marijuana. I mean, the, de the medical exam will, will put cause of death as blunt force trauma, because that's what really killed the person, the, the car smashing into the center divide. But um, but the cause behind it was, was someone who was impaired in driving. Um, and we've seen that often, unfortunately. As a matter of fact, the National Institute of Drug Abuse quotes a twofold increased risk of fatality when the driver is positive for THC. The graph below shows you know, a, a painful trend in perception of teenagers. They asked teen, high school teenagers, would you get, and be, have you gone behind the wheel of somebody um, who is drinking alcohol? And the answer was going down. That's the blue line. The percent, they're doing well in prevention. Ask the same question, would you get behind the wheel or have you gotten behind the wheel of someone who is using marijuana? And that line's going up in the wrong direction. So um, the high school seniors are not quite getting the message about drugged driving as they are getting the message about drunk driving. This is fatality data from San Diego. I work with the medical examiner um, here because I learn the most and I feel like I get to be a better physician by learning from people who died in order to implement prevention methods. So you could see drug deaths overall uh, have been going up over the years and THC association, we can't do causation yet, has been going up. And when I look at why do people die with THC in their system, it just makes me, well, cringe. One-year-old died with marijuana in their system. 15-year-old, 19-year-old lost control of a car, ran into a tree. That's not a marijuana death when you're high and you drive into a tree. Um, and, and it really makes me wanna ask more questions. Remember I told you about seizures. He was a 24-year-old with the seizures considered a natural death. Really? Is that natural or is that preventable? And I, I just wonder if all these are preventable. We need to ask the same kind of questions as we did 100 years ago with tobacco. So people do die from marijuana and don't let them tell you otherwise. Uh, there's associations with drug driving, with cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, with psychosis, with homicide violence, with blood clots and arteries that otherwise um, would not have heart disease. We've seen this and people do die we're just not documenting it. Again, just like 100 years ago with tobacco, we're not documenting it. We need to do better uh, with that. Um, frankly, we ended the opioid epidemic because we documented those deaths and we were able to end it. But without being able to track that, the, you know, the, the, the bell-shaped curve of the, the problems with marijuana will take longer than opioids because we don't have that data system. So back to our quiz, and now you'll know, because I'm sure it sounded confusing at the beginning, but now you'll know all these answers. Uh, which of these statements are true? Medical marijuana is recommended to treat opiate use disorder. No, American Society of Addiction Medicine clearly says no. THC receptors work at the same part of the body as pain receptors. No, I showed you those are different parts of the body. Medical marijuana is recommended or prescribed by doctors who complete a standard care medical evaluation. No, it's more like a pill mill where everybody gets it and um, it, it, they don't complete all the requirements that I need to as a physician to recommend anything to you. Marijuana use increases opiate use in people with chronic pain. Yes, big studies with thousands of patients have showed that you actually have increased use of opioids, not less when you're using marijuana. And medical marijuana prescription includes doses and drug interaction considerations. No, they don't, they don't do that. Um, um, it's just uh, kind of a recommendation that, that you don't get your vital signs taken. They don't check for drug interactions, allergies, or ask about any other problems like you do when you go to a doctor for any other medical condition. 
Here are a whole bunch of medical associations um, that have statements on marijuana that is a resource for you. You could find all these resources on the Isaac website. Isaac is a new organization. I am one of the founding members. It's called the International Academy on the Science and Impact of Cannabis. We're a group of doctors who are educating on marijuana. And uh, we created a medical library, and I really urge you to look at it. Um, I am the author of that library, so if there's any uh, mistakes or errors, just reach out to me and let me know. But um, I, I painstakingly went through 30 diagnoses. I continuously update it, and I translate the medical literature into talking points that you can use in your advocacy and in your understanding. And each of those talking points has a link to the original medical literature if you need more information. So I think that that's an invaluable resource um, for anybody who wants to educate on the potential harms of marijuana. There's like 14,000 publications. There's thousands of publications on the harms today on marijuana. And they, um, I don't have all of them listing. I just keep the, you know, the key ones for your advocacy. Um, this is a link to my uh, website uh, for my podcast. And so I talk uh, various uh, different subjects, not just on marijuana, but I do have a significant number. Of, I, I visited a pot shop and talked to people who are addicted. So um, I urge you to listen and give it five stars. And I really thank you all for listening, for taking an interest, for asking questions, for learning what's fact or fiction. And Laura, I thank you so much. Um, for your advocacy and creating Johnny's ambassadors. And I'm, I'm proud to be one of those ambassadors. Thank you so much, Renee. This is um, such a gift of, of your time and your wisdom. I am personally so thrilled to have these talking points, um, as I know many, many of our ambassadors will be uh, just because they're the things that we hear all the time, you know, it can't kill you. And your point is so valid, you know, ask me if marijuana can kill your child. Um, so, but there's so many things I think um, people don't know. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know about aspirin and bleeding and, and some of the other um, medical conditions that I'm really thrilled to be able to go look at uh, with Isaac. And thank you so much for providing that resource for us. I'm thrilled that most of the doctors, or I would say many of them have been on our series. And so now we can include you, uh, I believe in what is a world-class repository of experts, uh, marijuana such as yourself. So this has been a great uh, gift, thank you. And we have some questions. Uh, so Yay. if I can, yeah, read those to you, that would be great. Um, I'm gonna put my, clock here so I don't run over time. Uh, let's see. Dr. Lev, my brother died last August, so sorry, of an arrhythmia. He had stopped taking his prescribed meds in favor of medical marijuana and died about a year and a half later. Are you aware of any cases where patients stopped taking bona fide meds in favor of medical marijuana and suffered dire consequences as a result. Have you had a patient like that? Of course I do. And I even mentioned that here. First of all, I'm so sorry for your loss. It's it's just painful. And, and it's preventable. Makes it, it makes it more tragic when it's preventable. Yes. And it makes it even triply tragic when there are false claims on medicine and that cost your life. There's blood on their hands. There's blood on their hands for giving false yes. hope to people. When And I just think that that's terrible. Yes, I see that. And the most common place I see that it's like, oh, it helps my seizures. And now you're not taking your seizure medicines and you're having seizures again uh. and again and again, right? And yeah, if you stop, the, I, I had another case, I didn't show it to you, um, an older man, who was taking all these medicines and blood pressure medicine, diabetes medicines and a whole bag. And, and they were on a family reunion and, um, and the family and the, the grandpa was complaining to his grandson. It's like, you know, I, I, I can't sleep. I have all these medicines. And he said, well, why don't you try this uh, cannabis product? And he gave him a brownie and he slept like a baby. It was wonderful. A miracle drug. Yeah. Why take these bag of medicines when you could just have a brownie? The problem is he never woke up. Oh. He has liver disease. All those medicines are keeping you alive. 
You can't just replace them. And so I, I, I just think it's a travesty what happened um, to your brother, you know, for your personal loss, um, but the false claims, false hopes, and what happened probably is he was addicted to it. And most people who are addicted to marijuana don't admit that they're admitted, don't understand, because they feel that addiction, that's like what alcoholics get. They get all shaky and they need another, you know, some some more you know vodka afterwards or uh, heroin addiction where you're getting physically sick marijuana addiction is different marijuana addiction is when you stop using you feel anxious you can't sleep you have headaches not the not the side effects and addiction um, symptoms that other drugs do so when I explain that to pa patients they they understand it more because I go oh yeah I guess that does happen that is why and so he was addicted to that and then it makes you not care about your arrhythmia uh, medications. And it's like, I don't need this. I just need, um, you know, marijuana. And then you have terrible effects. I am so, so sorry. And unfortunately, it's not rare. And there are so many false health claims. And I don't blame the public. Like, I don't blame this family that gave a brownie to this grandpa. And I thought about that. Should I call Adult Protective Services? I mean, they almost killed their grandpa, but they didn't mean to. They're just getting information um, from all over the place um, with false health claims. They're they're not getting it from you know people like me um, who really evaluate and think about risk benefits and tell the truth and 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 don't have a, a financial gain to say one thing or the other. Well, and eventually some of those docs were shut down, you know, the ones like you mentioned with the pill mills, and it is a crime, and it is it is uh, preventable. Should there be some sort of responsibility, liability, you know, wrongful death lawsuit um, that can be brought against these doctors? You know, what's it? what is it going to take for them when in Colorado, you know, an 18-year-old can claim to have a migraine and pay a few hundred bucks to the pot shop doc and legally buy shatter in a medical marijuana dispensary like our son and become psychotic and and kill himself why why don't the doctors who do this have any criminal liability they're clearly um not directly causing, but providing something that otherwise maybe Johnny would still be here. Maybe um, this gentleman's brother would still be here. Is it going to take a massive, you know, lawsuit? Well, I, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't give legal advice. But I'd be raise my hand to be a medical expert on such cases, and I just would because I do think that they're li liable. They're calling themselves doctors, and they went to medical school. You, I mean, my, I have two daughters in medical school. They, <laughs> they are working their butts off. It's a very painful process to go through medical school and residency. Like it's long, it's very hard. And, and they have to uphold to a certain standard. And that all goes straight to the toilet when recommending marijuana. How, how, did, did you ask this person? I had, here's another one. I got this guy, he's got in the emergency department for back pain. And he's so proud of his medical marijuana card. He paid $50 and look at me. I don't need opioids. I am, I'm using my marijuana. I just put it in this little vape. And he's so proud of himself. And his blood pressure was 220 over 120. He's gonna, you know, risk of stroke. Really, you went to a doctor and they gave you this recommendation where you are a high risk, you know, ticking time bomb for a cardiac event. What kind of doctor does that? Mm. You know, so I, I, Again, I'm not a legal expert, but the yeah. system is obviously broken and it, and uh, that medical uh, system does not fall. I think it's a it's an absolute insult to my profession to call that medical. Um, and uh, if you listen to my podcast, I talk to I go visit a marijuana dispensary and there. Here's a guy who is a, you know, a store manager and he's talking to people and he calls them their patients. It's like you're not a doctor. Wow. But he's acting like one. That must be difficult for you when you attend medical conferences when you stumble across a physician physician prescribing you know marijuana. How you just I would be incredulous. I mean, do you ever confront them? It, yeah, say, I, 
it's, with all it's these people, worse. <laughs> it's worse than you think. I, I actually just wrote a resolution for the American College of Emergency Physicians that we should simply, really non-controversial, not about legalization, just as emergency physician, we should advocate and let the public know about the harms that we're seeing every single day. It's just not me. Every one, one of my colleagues is yes. taking care, seeing cases of marijuana poisonings every day. And that was considered con con controversial. I could not get that passed among the California wow. emergency physicians because there's a young generation who are like, oh, but we, you know, we don't want to criminalize and, and we don't want to talk about legal. And, I don't care about legalization and it shouldn't be criminalized, but as a doctor, we have a public health duty and a duty to our public, our, our patients Excellent. to prevent harms That's a great and, um, and, and to educate. And, and, yes. and that's what I think that we need to be doing. That's what the, the Isaac, the International Academy of Science and Impact of Cannabis, not about judging. It's about, you know, explaining the science and, and the harm so people can make informed decision making. And unfortunately, um, the public, um, no fault of their own, is getting you know bombarded with how it's so wonderful and uh, not harmful, oh, and which is far from the truth. Well, and now you have the uh, Democrats putting forth a bill uh, with had up, up by Schumer to legalize marijuana federally. And you hear them on the interviews on the Today Show and other uh, um, journalistic uh, magazines, you know, who basically say, oh, it's tax revenue. They they are practically, they do ignore all of these public tobacco, health. Tobacco, tobacco is great tax revenue. And uh, jeweling and vaping is great tax revenue. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean it's healthy. <laughs> Well, hopefully good for you. the legislators will be able to see through that and consider public health uh, more important than the money in their pocket and, and greed. Um, do we know of any carcinogens in marijuana edibles or other non-smoked forms? Um, oh, that's a good question. And I... I know there's different carcinogens in that all those chemicals, so it depends on what's in in there. Um, so there probably are, but I couldn't name them for you if you wanted to okay. say what um, that they are. The 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 fungus and contaminants like that are more in the smoked products, and that's important to know because I have cancer patients who say, you know, I'm in pain. Should I use opiates, which are terrible? They got a terrible gut pain. Or should I use marijuana? And I'm saying use the opiates. You are a cancer patient who's immunocompromised. That means you're more susceptible to infection. If you smoke a product, you're more susceptible to get infection than if I smoke that product and I don't have immunocompromised. So use the opioids, use the pain medicines. Great point. Um, do these people who end up in the hospital for marijuana use, such as the person who was put on life support after eating, uh, having the marijuana, do they stop using and change their opinion about pot? Wow, that's a great question. I've talked to a couple patients about that. There's actually um, a gentleman who is part of the Truth Initiative for vaping because oh. he was placed on life support. He was as close to death as anybody could be. Young man, I think he was in high school or college, mm. and, and he speaks about how he got E. Valley, the vaping um, disease from, from being addicted to marijuana. And he goes around the country uh, and talks about the harms of smoking marijuana, but he still used the edibles. So he got the message that it almost killed his lungs, but he didn't get the message wow. that of all those products. So, so there is a disconnect. I have yeah. another gentleman who was on my podcast, the same guy who um, popped his lung uh, and he got the message not to smoke and he stopped smoking, but he continued the edibles here and there probably to treat his addiction. And I'm hoping over time he'll, he'll, he'll cut that back. Well, you hear so many young people. I just heard of one yesterday who uh, is scrometing, as you described, uh, but they just don't believe that it could possibly be uh, the marijuana, right? Or that they just need to stop for a week, right? Until the vomiting goes away. And and they just, they they go back to it. And it's to your point, part of the addiction, 
uh, because then it's easy to say, oh, well, see, now I feel horrible. The marijuana was making me feel better, not understanding that, of course, that is part of being addicted and going through the withdrawals. How long does it take someone like that who is highly addicted, you know, let's say he's 20 years old using in a high frequency uh, many times a day and, and dabbing a high potency? How long would you think as a doctor you would say it would take for him to to not use marijuana in order to not suffer these withdrawal and other medical effects that you're describing? Well, two things. One is withdrawal, that anxiety you feel by not having it, that I just need it. That I tell patients about two weeks. And then there's there's no hard line in medicine. There's some people who do better, and some people take longer, okay? But I, I give them an average of two weeks. If you're using more frequently for more years, it may be longer for you. Um, there's also, uh, interestingly, a gene associated with marijuana addiction. So I don't know mm. if you have, and I will never know if you have that genetic predisposition to use. Mm. Um, so, so that's one thing is the withdrawal. The second one, how long will I feel better from, you know, from scrumming, from cannabis hyperemesis syndrome? Um, and uh, again, it depends on how long you've been using, how much you've been using. Um, for health, because the, the cause of that is the receptors are no longer working. Um, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. So how long will it take those receptors to normalize? And it could be as quick as a week, just give it a week, stop using, and you know, you'll, your stomach will feel better or, or longer. And then what happens is like, oh, you know, I didn't use for one or two weeks, and then you use it again because it didn't work for me, but now you're, you never got a chance for your receptors to, to to work Kick again. Back in. So it yeah. sounds like the only cure is to be sober. <laughs> That's a definite cure. I mean, yeah. I don't, that is like a if you, 100% if you, if you don't if you want to will, throw up anymore. You be, then otherwise you'll, you know, you'll struggle along and uh, understanding the power of addiction is very powerful, but it's treatable. This has been amazing. Renee, Dr. Lev, um, thank you so much uh, for pleasure. giving us this time and this very invaluable information. We encourage everyone to link. And I'll also put on your um, page to the Isaac website uh, with all of those resources. Um, best presentation ever. Thank you, that was amazing. Appreciate your time. You're getting a lot of love and uh, great feedback on here. So. Thanks again for joining us and being Thank one of Johnny's. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye bye.